and the Clippers right there. Awesome. What's up, Houston? We uh, drove in early this morning from Austin, Texas, so we're here for you all. Who all is out of state? You drove in? Wow, that's like most of the room. And then who's local here in Houston? Okay, the other half, so we're like 50-50. Uh, really cool. So how many today in the room have a website that is dynamic to the visitor? Today, you're using personalization on your site. Raise the hands. Okay, so we got three out of, I would say, roughly 50 in the crowd. So in 10 years from now, I think that when this question is asked again, most of the hands will be in the room. Just as like 10 years ago, nobody was saying that they were using social media. And now today, how many in the room are using social media by raise of hands? 100% of the room. And the reason why this is, if we look at advertising about 10 years ago, it couldn't be personalized. A lot of our ads were, um, you know, random. They were based on, you know, geographic area, but they weren't definitely based on us. And at the time, it was just normal. But now today, if you see an ad that's not personalized to you, if you feel like, why are they targeting me? And as with all the marketers in the room, you know exactly what they can and can't do. I'm frustrated when I see like Huggies diapers on my Facebook. I'm like, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm 26 and I don't have a kid. You should get your targeting right, right? And, and so in the future though, if you go to Nike.com, today they will show you male and female shoes. In 10 years from now, I would assume that they'll cater towards the male with the option of going female or vice versa who you are. So we look at the reason why this is, and it's mostly because of data. Data has been the big problem. And what happens with experiences when they're gone wrong is that actually has the reverse effect, a bad effect. And so when we uh, look at bad experiences that were sold as a dream, it's very much like fire Festival. How many in the room get this reference? Okay. See, you were sold a dream that personalization is coming and it's happening big, yet when you get to the island, you're sold very short. That it doesn't work, it failed, couldn't attach the audience correctly, and you thought you were gonna have a remarkable experience, but then you hear with uh, uh, Jay Money and the other guys trying to uh, figure out how to get off an island. Maybe you signed up for a, a personalization software and just come to find out it, uh, it's more of a toy set. And I, I'm with you. I, I've been frustrated by the same challenge for so long. Um, the strategy in itself is untapped as well. So many of you are the creative in the room and maybe not the development side. Even if you have the developers there ready to help you out, how do you know what to do? And so today I'm gonna share both tactics and uh, strategy on how to implement personalization, ultimately to delight your visitors, to give them a positive brand impression, but then also how to achieve maximum conversion. Because ultimately, as online businesses, if you're getting most of your business through online traffic, uh, it is your storefront. It is the first play and the last play where they learn about your business. And so this is a really uh, a key part because so often in the past, we're chokeholded to our campaigns to be focused on either one channel like Facebook versus Google AdWords or Twitter. And you know, the traffic that goes to those pages, they have to talk to them differently. Or what about different markets? When you know, you're trying to serve three different audiences, but your copy can only talk to one and resonate with one efficiently. In the past, all of these have been challenges, but if you can know who the visitor are and adapt the site to them, that's the beauty of what the future of our websites could be. Our store can be completely dynamic who, to whoever the shopper is. So I'll begin with a story of a recent personalized experience, but it wasn't online, it was offline. So often though, we can take these learnings that are offline and apply them to our online businesses. Actually, I think if you're stuck on a computer all day and you don't get your head out and look at what other offline businesses are doing, you might be missing opportunities. So recently I took, uh, it was about a year ago uh, at this time, I was in Cape Town, South Africa, and I saved up a bunch of points. Um, we had just graduated a, a program called Y Combinator, and then um, we were planning on moving to Austin, Texas. Now, at this time, 
I was kind of like between cities. I was going from like Palo Alto to Maryland to Atlanta. And I was like, really wanting to travel the world before I, I root into headquarters in Austin. So got on a plane and uh, went to Cape Town. And I was sitting here. I, I ended up paying for first class, all with points. It was like my first time going international with it. And as soon as I get on the plane, the flight attendant goes, asks me a great question. She goes, Austin, she knew my name by my ticket, which is pretty cool. And then she goes, would you like champagne or mimosa? Now, in the room, what you, would you guys choose, champagne or mimosa? Mimosa, right? Yeah, so I said, I'd like a mimosa, but hold the orange juice, please. And this is me here in first class. Um, and what I liked about this experience is that it was extremely personalized because they asked me all of the right questions. And that's the first step, is to ask the right questions. Every step in personalization and any experience in general begins there. We have to receive some data to be able to alter the, cha the channels. As, as we learn more, we can get better and more personalized. And so throughout it, you know, they asked me for meals, you know, would I like a veggie meal or a meat meal or a fish meal? And so throughout the entire experience, I feel like I'm being catered to and they're meeting me where I am. They're not serving me just the standard plate. All right, so the next part of a great experience that for so long has been lost online, but I think a lot of you guys get it, is taking away friction. A frictionless experience will increase conversions dramatically, but so often this friction um, comes from all the problems I mentioned earlier, that our channel, our, all of our, our website has to be for one specific person. That's why we call, we, we're always told to niche down in our businesses because you can only resonate with one at a time. Well, I look at here the old friction of ordering a taxi. I arrived in Cape Town and luckily they had Wi-Fi in the airport because I didn't have service and I was able to get on Uber. But in the past, 10 years ago, I would have to hail a taxi and then I have to try and understand their language and then negotiate a currency that I didn't understand. And by the end, I'm completely worried for my life that I'll go to the wrong place or end up in a place I never intended to be. All of that changed with Uber. And so if we look at the companies that are really disrupting in the world, it's not about what they sell, it's about how they sell it. And this is where we're getting here in the new experiences is that you have an opportunity to increase your conversion rates and delight your customers by changing how you're selling, not just what you're selling. Ultimately, I'm getting a ride to go to my destination. Same as a taxi. It was just the friction that it took to get there that was the difference. And then finally, a great experience is a delightful experience, one that is uniquely remarkable. Uh, I was very excited to go to this one vineyard. It was in uh, Stellenbosch, which is about 45 minutes north of Cape Town. And I went here specifically because I read all the reviews that they'll serve you wine at 8 a.m. with breakfast, but the breakfast is not pancakes or waffles, it's ice cream. And it was incredible. They will serve red wine with a, a strawberry ice cream and then white wine with a Picasso ice cream. It was fantastic. And of course, so delightful because when on earth do you get to have ice cream and wine for breakfast? So I treated this everywhere and I was really enjoying myself. And then I was like, I would pay so much more for an experience like this than just a normal like, you know, uh, uh, crackers, meat, cheese plate with ice cream, or with, uh, with uh, uh, wine. And I realized that being remarkable is important today because of what the other speakers mentioned. Our attention is being pulled in every direction. So pretty uh, recently after tweeting this, I had this epiphany and I tweeted this again. That experiences magnify value. If you have a product today and you turn that into an experience, you can increase the price of your product by 18. 18 times the price of a product. And I, uh, I did research what the cost of grapes are, and then the average glass of, uh, glass of wine, and then most glasses of wine 
or times four at a restaurant when it's served to you. And then when this same glass of wine is served to you in a form of an experience, whether it's on a sailboat or it's told through a story, it's much more. And so, yes, you can make your own wine and try and deliver your own experience. But if somebody d comes in, turns that commodity into a product, into a service, and then ultimately into the experience, you'll be charged 18 times that initial price to cost to prepare it. And this is incredible. It's incredible because most of us are selling products and services. And we have a lot of room in the market to turn it into an experience. Luckily, this can happen online now and not just offline. So, uh, in short, I'll be very brief on this slide. My name is Austin Distel, CMO at Proof. We're a bootstrap startup, a startup that basically got to zero po to uh, 2.5 million in annual recurring revenue in under 24 months, uh, all through online marketing. Uh, before this, I had a marketing agency along with the uh, co-founders. Uh, basically, traffic and conversion was our whole life. We did it for a lot of clients, and we also taught courses online on how to do Facebook ads, Google AdWords, SEO, etc. And ultimately, what that came us to find is that conversion's the hard part. A lot of us here in the room can get traffic, but conversion is what we all really struggle with. So we started to try and create software products on how do we solve conversion. And we created a, a, a software that works really dang well called uh, Proof Notifications. Won't get into that today, but uh, today we uh, graduated Y Combinator with that. And about 18,000 sites uh, use that software to boost conversion, including Oprah Winfrey, Kevin Harrington from Shark Tank, and Digimarcon. So what makes a great experience? Well, it's personalized, it's frictionless, and it's remarkably delightful. These are all exciting positions because they're not often thought about in the world of marketing. We're really excited about brand. We're excited about new campaigns and video. Video is the hot word for the last 10 years. But if you look at how those can be implemented to reduce friction, to personalize your site, to make a remarkable experience, then you can stand out from the crowd. Personalized experiences, increased conversions, shorten the buying cycle, and create raving fans. I think shorting the buying cycle is pretty interesting too because it's not about matching who they are but where they are in the journey. Who here in the room is trying to serve multiple verticals, markets, personas? You have you know, more than one person that might buy your product. They have very different intentions. They have very different needs, different buying power. It's a lot of people in the room. The challenge that you're faced with is that you have a static site. What if you could only show one ad to all of those markets? Would it perform very well? Probably not. So this is where it gets very exciting. Life cycle stages. Well, I think all of us in the room do. We all have people that are the first time they're ever hearing about our company and then they become a lead and they start to consider us and then finally they take action. Now, is your website matching where they are in the journey? Are your call to actions changing? based on the last actions or previous pages that they've gone. If they watch 45 seconds into your YouTube video, or they watch the commercial all the way through on YouTube, does your website change the next time they visit? Who here has multiple traffic sources? You're doing Facebook ads, Google AdWords, you have TV, radio, newsprint. All of them are probably funneling to some sort of website, a landing page. Now, are you trying to duplicate your landing page a hundred times, one for each channel source to match the copy on that page or to match the context of where they are based on city, based on state? Well, these are all been challenges that actually all of us still face today, including ourselves. We are eating our own dog food at Proof. And uh, in fact, we weren't a personalization software until last year. Uh, we, I was just, as a, as a marketer trying to grow our company, trying to figure out the answer to all of these questions. So, is it all right if I share some of our own stats from our A-B test today with you that have worked and have not worked and how we're solving this? Is that okay with you all today? Okay, it will be focused on our business, but it will be real stats that I personally run these experiments 
all the way to 98% uh, statistical significance. Just want to make sure that's okay with you all. Cool. All right. We are trying to build landing pages for each situation. We know the chaos of that. I'm building landing pages for every single situation. And it has been chaotic, I'll be honest. Um, at one point, my Instapage account had 14 different landing pages that I would just duplicate for each audience that might use us because we serve at Proof everybody from real estate finance, uh, course creators, um, software companies, right? And so when they go to our website, it doesn't make sense. We have to actually make a different ad with a different landing page and a different email follow-up sequence for each market if we want to tackle it efficiently. So yeah, my HubSpot account looked like that. All of the workflows, automations, my Zapiers doing 100 zaps a day, it got a little wild. But the internet is changing. Internet 1.0, probably about 10 years ago, our visitors would go to one site that was very large and they had to navigate it themselves. Uh, you know, you have footers, you have navigation, you have all of this stuff that's before the funnel. You send all traffic sources to the same place, no matter who they are, if they're a customer or if they're a first time visitor, they see the same thing. The second wave, which has been the last five years, there's a lot of landing page companies that have come out and thank God for them because now they allow us to quickly duplicate a site and you know, have specific intentions throughout the way. We call these funnels, right? So we have different personas for different funnels and each stage of the buying journey. How many guys are implementing funnels today? You've moved from internet 1.0 to 2.0 by raise of hands who are on the internet 2.0 today. Most of y'all, awesome. The challenge with this, it's time intensive because you have to duplicate all this stuff over and over again. Automations just uh, aren't always uh, effective. Then you have internet 3.0, which we're on the cutting edge of this uh, as, as marketing uh, across the whole landscape. But there are a few leaders. Ultimately, what this will be is one website or maybe a few different versions of a site, different landing pages that are dynamic based on who they are and where they are. And if you want to think about this as from internet 1.0 to 2.0 was one plus one. Each time you duplicate a landing page, it's only plus one. With 3.0, it's almost going into the power of three because there are literally four times four times four, six, like it gets wildly uh, more complex. But if you have one website that's dynamic, it's actually more simple than ever before. And so this is because, let's say they match five different avatars. Um, you have a CEO visits the site, but he happens to be in, a, in the software industry whose company employee count is over 200 and uh, they're in Wisconsin. Okay, do you have a landing page that fits that criteria? Well, each element can be changed. Let's say that headline is only specific to the industry. The testimonial is only based on job title. The call to action is based on where they are in the life cycle. And the background image is the city that they're in. Do you see how making a landing page for that over and over again is actually literally impossible, but highly personalized and highly effective? That's the future that is coming soon. And there's a couple of companies that I'll, I'll bring up here that are doing it very well. You already know this though, you're studying them. Amazon, when you're logged in and logged out, is very different. YouTube, logged in, logged out, very different. If a Netflix recommended me a horror film, I'd be like, wait, am I in my own Netflix account because all I watch are rom-coms? So these are the companies to pay attention to. How do we do it at proof? Because we're just a startup. We're bootstrapped uh, to our first uh, you know, 24 months we were trying to do this stuff. Uh, now we're funded through Y Combinator, but this is still a really big challenge. As a team, we're only 14, probably one of the smaller companies in the room. How are we doing marketing that enterprise clients aren't doing yet? So let me walk through what a normal buying process might be. This is our homepage. Uh, and the first time that they visit, we just want them to learn, get interested in our product. We don't need them to start a trial yet. That'd be a little too soon, right? So we ask them, watch a demo. Before we show them the demo, we take them to a survey. 
say, hey, what industry are you in? Because like every great experience, the first step is asking the right question. And so we ask questions here to get persona data. Here we're asking the industry, SaaS e-commerce coaching agency. Once they click on this in the cookies, we attach who they are. Okay, now we've updated a few things. They're sent to this uh, demo registration page. And on the next page, I'll be doing a demo. I'll show you that. But notice, let's say that we're in the SaaS audience. Our headline now says, see why the fastest growing SaaS companies use proof to acquire more users. Benefit statements have been focused on how SaaS companies, their terminology, the way that they view acquisition, et cetera, is maybe different than an e-commerce company. Um, and then we look at other related SaaS companies that do use us already. If these were e-commerce product, uh, e-commerce companies, they might not relate to that. And so now we show other uh, solutions that they can relate to. As we scroll down the page, we also have a, uh, we, we fuel in all of these testimonials that are also based on industry. And the tabs are all there, but we just have the tab highlighted based on the industry they're in. Then this page is headlined at the very end, the call to action uh, is, is again focused on the industry. And uh, by the way, this is our product right here. It's a notification. That has also been personalized. It says uh, 50 SaaS marketers have watched the demo in the last seven days. That's what it says there on the slide. And so how do we continue to personalize this today? I'll show you that literally how you can do this without any products, without any um, uh, development. You can do this as marketers today, uh, which is really exciting. So we do this not only for SaaS, we change the, the website for e-commerce, coaches, and agencies. Obviously, an agency is looking at our product, not on behalf of themselves, but they're shopping on behalf of their clients. And so the way that we approach vendors should be very different than the way we uh, uh, try and go for somebody that's on the brand team at a company. They buy very differently. So once they opt in, they go to a page that actually the video, it's not personalized to the industry. However, uh, the headline is, and so they, it's kind of framed around this industry and it feels personalized, which is really interesting um, because they actually do believe that it is personalized for them when I ask uh, in, in surveys. Okay, so let's say that they didn't actually take my offer to start a free 14 day trial. The next time they go to the page, let's call it four days later. We, they've already completed the action. So should they watch the demo again? No, they've already done that. So their life cycle has changed from uh, awareness to now consideration and interest. So they need to learn about pricing. They need to um, you know, possibly start a free trial. So when they click on that, it'll go to the pricing page and it'll continue forward. So we have now updated the call to action and also notice the headline remembers, the headlines always remember which industry you're in. Also, as you're going throughout our product, it's not just on our marketing site, we pass this data through into the product. The headlines, uh, even the testimonial there uh, for a SaaS company, this is Gustav, who's uh, one of our uh, uh, mentors and Y commenter. He was the head of growth at Airbnb. And so he had a little testimonial there. Um, so throughout this, it always changes based on who the visitor is. Now we ran an A-B test for two weeks. 9,000 people saw a, person, uh, a personalized page in an unpersonalized version. And they were held in the audience. They couldn't get out of it. It was locked under their device, their cookies, their email, the whole deal. At the end of two weeks, we saw a 54% increase in demo registrations through personalizing those headlines and um, even adding that extra step of friction, asking them uh, what industry they're in. Even by adding that, we still saw the increase in demo registrations. Not only that, that's just leads. 32% increase in new trials. This is huge for us. They opened up twice in the funnel. It means that more leads happened and out of that even more trials happened. So ultimately, this is a huge win for our business, and we're really excited to publish these case studies. Um, they are on our blog, so if you want to like see deeper on how we did it, you can see there. And I think a lot of you guys are thinking, that's really cool, Austin. Where do I start for myself? Well, 
there are three steps to getting it set up. The first one, source user data into one place. The issue today is that our data is in HubSpot, it's in Intercom, it's in, um, all, it's in, your, it's in your email, it's in your chat, it's on uh, your social medias, it's in your Google Analytics. It's so distributed that you can't call it from one place, which is why I would recommend Segment. Um, you can send all of that into one place, and then you can read, uh, you can pull from one central source of truth. Well, I'll get into that in a second. The second is a, uh, a strategy, a strategy that wins. And we've been studying this for, you know, a good part of a year now, um, and not just on us, but on clients, and we're doing a lot of fulfillment work right now on personalization, so we're really in the weeds. And I'm going to share some of the results that we've seen for other people as well. And then you have uh, the tools. Now you can do this with custom code. You can do this uh, through manual work, like duplicating landing pages. Uh, or you could use visual builders like Proof. Now, step one, how do we source our user data into one place? I'll give you an example of how we do it. You have HubSpot, and then, which is email marketing. And then you have a third-party data provider like Clearbit that can enrich your leads with known public information. So, for example, if you have a lead in HubSpot, then you can say, hey, Clearbit, what's their job title on LinkedIn? And it'll just fill up all that stuff. And you can create even better segments. It's really cool. And then you have Google Analytics. So what's going on on your site? Which pages have they visited, et cetera? And then maybe a sales platform, Salesforce, Terminus, uh, Mad Kudu, you know, there's many lead scoring uh, softwares that you can use, but you want to compile all of this information into a central source of truth. What is the data that you want? Now, these are just a couple examples, but you have buckets, company, personal, behavior, some will say firmographic, demographic, um, and contextual. I think this is easier. So where do we then get that data from? Well, if I want to find out revenue data, I can call Clearbit and say, hey, what's the revenue known by Crunchbase? How much have they raised in funding? Uh, you know, we can look at personal information, such as income, job title, age, interest. And full contact is kind of like what the internet knows about us. It's going to pull in social media that's public, Twitter, clout score, all the good stuff. If you want to, if you ever like logged into an app and they already have your Facebook profile picture in there, they're probably using full contact or, Graviti or, or uh, Gravatar. And then you have uh, behavioral. So if they've done this, then do this. Zapier and Segment are uh, routing tools. So they can route you if you've done one thing, trigger another thing to happen. How many of you guys use anything in this tech stack? Does it any, all look familiar? Which ones do you use? Zapier. Zapier? Mm -hmm. Zapier makes you happier, that's for sure. So create strategies. Or number two, create a good strategy. I think that part of this is removing friction because while this might not be personalized yet, it sets the canvas for you to personalize effectively. And so let's break down on what it looks like to change the way that we sell. All of these companies don't really have that revolutionary of products. Yet, they are the known disruptors in the industries today. Not because of what they sell, but how they sell it. The old way of selling a product, I was told when I went to University of Georgia, my teacher said that you have to have a product that's 10 times better than the competition to be able to change the marketplace, to be able to grab attention. How many were told similar logic by mentors? A few. It's a saying that's been going around for, I guess, decades. But I think that today, a lot of things have changed. The new way is that your experience has to be 10 times lighter than the competition. And we know that this is true because these companies exist. Casper, they sent you a mattress in the mail. Imagine the last time that you had to go to like Mattress King and you have to like jump up and down on the mattresses, see if you like it. You're worried about return policies. Look at Carvana, they send you a car in the mail. It's wild. Look at Rent the Runway. You have college girls now wearing dresses that Angelina Joe Lee wore on the runway to prom or something like that. And then you have Warby Parker. They send you, let's say, five, 
pairs of glasses in the mail. You try it, send the four other back that you don't want. Not all that novel of products, but the way that you acquire those products is totally different. And so if you can start here, then you can give yourself an amazing canvas to personalize on. And all of these are doing personalization pretty well at this point. You know, dresses based on what you've ordered in the past. You can do Dollar Shave Club has amazing upsells based on, you know, the, the different categories of man that you are, whether you're uh, shaving or you're trying to get hair back. There's all kinds of uh, demographics that they're able to solve because they have you log in. Because their experience has to be delivered in a different way. The good news from Darmesh, the CTO of HubSpot, he goes, the good news is that improving your experience today is 10 times easier than making your product 10 times better. This is so true. I mean, imagine if like your company tried to just 10X, there's no way. However, you can get with your sales team and your marketing team and your support team and help figure out what are the five biggest ports of friction, remove those. High friction points, let's kind of make this more tangible. These are some of the high friction examples. Is your, do I have to have a calculator to figure out how much I need to pay you? Is there an invoice? Like I have to opt in for an invoice, right? These are really old school ways instead of just having a calculator on the website. How about, um, you know, you can only call during business hours or uh, there's no chat. I have to literally call um, instead of just chatting on your website to figure out the answer. Soon there's now robots that will, are in help docs that you can say, you know, how do I change my password? And there it is, a article, immediately search terms on how to change your password. Buying first uh, versus trying first, I'll show you that. Long buying cycles is like, do you have to get decisions made by 15 people or qualify them just to figure out if it's even worth it to do business with you? That's the old high friction way, but great opportunities to grow. What's the new low friction way? Simple pricing. That's what all of those other companies did. Mattress firm, all of them, complex pricing with like, you had to amortize your payments and get a credit card that's a mattress firm credit card. Whereas Casper is just like, hey, send it back if you don't want it. Simple pricing, it's a trial run, right? Customer schedule versus um, uh, your schedule, the business schedule. Uh, try first versus buy first, shorter buying cycles. I think today the decision can be made so much quicker because we're empowering leadership uh, to allow people to try things before you buy it. For example, if you're at large companies and you're shopping out software solutions, you have to get approval to get budget all of this time. However, if you gave them a 30 day free trial, they could poke around without questions and see if it's the right solution. See that try first allows for all that friction to get removed and it allows uh, for more data to be acquired for later personalization. So where does the strategy even begin? Reduce it, remove points of highest friction. And this is really just a conversion rate optimization strategy. Figure out where the biggest drop-offs are in the funnel. Look at your Google Analytics page one, two, and three and see the page two to three is the biggest friction. Focus on page two. This is the easiest place to begin. Secondly, Optimize not only for acquiring more customers, but making sure that their experience overall is delightful. How do you get them to come back more often? How do you get that brand impression to inspire them to share it on social media, to tell their best friends about it? Now we're getting into remarkable and delightful experiences. These great rating fans. And so you've recognized all of these brands and they have differentiated themselves by being truly remarkable, by you actually being excited to do business with them. I know that like, if I go on a virgin plane, I'm like really excited because I'm hoping that one day Richard Branson's like in a costume and he's like gonna serve me a mimosa. But I look at Disney World growing up, it was uh, every, every summer, our whole family like looked forward to going to Disney World. And they've done just a, such a remarkable job at making um, a membership to Disney World actually more, uh, like le less price than a one time going to Disney World. And so it actually incentivizes them to encourage uh, better experiences long term. Ritz Carlton, uh, 
Uh, one of our partners at Proof recently went there for um, his one year anniversary. And when he got out of the limo, the bellhop literally goes, hi, welcome to the Ritz Carlton, Dave. He knew that the client was on his way and the driver actually uh, picked them up from the airport and then drove them to the Ritz Carlton somehow, let the person know this is Dave, maybe it was in the window or something, I don't know, but literally greeted him at the door of the Ritz Carlton. What a remarkable experience. I love it, Chick-fil-A, I'm from Atlanta, home brand. Uh, every time that you say thank you, do you guys know what they say? My pleasure. That's so delightful. It's way more delightful than McDonald's where, you know, they always just forget the straw in my cup, right? They never forget anything. The friction points, these are the opportunities where you can differentiate. And like I said, experiences amplify value. And so Chick-fil-A, if they wanted to, they could be twice as expensive as McDonald's and I'd be happy to pay that. I looked at J. Crew recently and I thought that their personalization strategy was very interesting. They will recommend you products that complete the outfit of other products that you have in your car. And so if you have the shirt, they'll recommend you jeans and boots that like might be on the mannequin. Because at the end of the day, like we just want to look good. They take the thinking out of it. Uh, I like Gusto. We use them for uh, doing all of our payroll and uh, benefits. And now they know actually that I'm a customer. And so they don't try and sell me. They've removed their entire home landing page, anything that has to do with sales, and they just welcome me back. That is delightful. How often do you buy something like you just bought? I like how uh, Airbnb here is personalizing for me. They know that I'm in Austin, and they know my part of town, and they say, Austin, uh, you can make almost 2000 a month hosting your home in Austin. What a, a high converting ad that has to be nationwide. Incredibly personalized um, and delightful at the end of the day. So we talked about the three steps to implementing personalization. You gotta source the data, you gotta create the strategy and you gotta implement it. I'm gonna briefly talk about implementing it and using tools, then using it on, uh, from as a marketer without devs. And then the cool stuff you could do if you had devs on your team, maybe you guys have larger teams, or maybe you even have technical marketers on your team that can hack stuff together. So let's start off with examples that you don't need custom code and you don't need devs. You guys have uh, multiple buyers, remember that question. Good group of you guys. Here, um, we are personalizing based on industry. So if you have all of these different markets that might buy from you, rather than trying to pitch them each, Ask them a question first. We call these uh, survey funnels. And uh, at, this just collects information. You don't even have to actually get their lead information. All you have to do is this is a router. It's a page and it doesn't have to look like this. It could be a pop-up you know, before they ever see anything. It just routes them to the correct page. And all you would do is duplicate the landing page three times, one for each market. And you know, just change out the headlines, images and call to actions based on who they are. Now, they might not remember next time they go to the homepage and all of that, but in this step, like I told you, increase demo registrations 54%. You can do this without code, and you can do this without any, what you see is what you get editors. Very effective. If you guys have multiple traffic sources, um, I'll show you, well, if you use Instapage, uh, this is a pretty cool landing page software where uh, you can have in the UTM, it will know what the source is, the UTM campaign, let's say Twitter versus Facebook, and change the headline of the landing page. So you only make one landing page and it changes the headline based on where they came from. Really good paid traffic strategy if you want to re reduce your uh, cost per acquisition. I'll show you the way here. Uh, now let's talk about ways that we do it at Proof. Uh, and this is before we were ever had any software that could do personalization. Uh, me and one developer got together and we're like, how do we personalize based on traffic source uh, from our referral product? So here is our product uh, last year. It said basically, Michael from San Francisco just uh, requested a product demo two minutes ago. It's real person that opted in our site. 
and it says powered by proof. That branding is a large portion of our acquisition. If it's on you know, 18,000 sites that all have that, um, they, each, each visitor on their 18,000 sites sees proof, some percent of them are going to get see powered by proof and want that. All right, so how do I now optimize this experience? Well, first idea is I want them to want to keep branding on and I also, we're marketers, uh, how awful is pow powered by proof? I can't stand that uh, because it's so self-focused. It's about our company. So I was like, scrap that. Let's focus it on our customer. And we're going to make it verified by proof. Verified because it's a real person taking a real action. And uh, at the end of the day, we all want significance, that our sales are enough, that our product is valid, that uh, customers can trust to buy this because other customers have already done so. That's why we do ver verified by proof. And when somebody clicks on that, now it goes to a landing page that's completely personalized to where they were our customers. So Digimarcon uh, you know, uses proof. And so this is literally, if you click on their branding, it'll say this. And it's not like I have a landing page built for every single 18,500 customers. We do this with a simple line of code um, that anybody that's had you know, at least one year of uh, full, tech, full tech stack experience will be able to whip this up. So we have the headline change. We have uh, some mock-ups change. And um, throughout their entire journey, we're actually amplifying back to the customer. Trust them. Go back to them. All the call to action say, go back to Gigi Marcon's website. And because it was personalized, based on this, we did an A-B test. And our visit of this to a new trial was 0.5% of people that clicked on Powered by Proof started a trial. Later on, we had that verified by proof out of the personalization step in between. 1.42% uh, now from click to new trial from this channel. That's a 175% increase in new trials from this channel by personalizing based on the referral partner. This is incredibly huge. How many guys are um, growing your business rapidly through channel, through uh, uh, partnerships, through referral partners, through agencies, through um, anybody that might be a vendor of your product, uh, is that, how, who here has that as their main channel of, of acquisition? Not many? Okay. Well, you could do this based on Facebook ad campaigns. You could do this based on um, events. We do this often for events. One landing page that changes based on South by Southwest, that changes based on Digimarcon, or Trafficking Conversion Summit, one landing page that just switches for the campaign they're in. And you can do this with or without code. If you use Instapage, it's without code. If you do it with one developer, it's a day's worth of work. All right, so here's uh, tactically how you do it. You just uh, bring in the UTM campaign into the headline, and uh, you use this source of code, Instapage or that code, and it'll update. And then there's other, uh, these are, many other vendors that uh, you can do this with, but they have like what you see is what you get. So you can click on the headline, change it, change the audience and say, if this audience shows, then change the headline. Um, I made this wacky landing page just because I'm a marketer that gets off on you know, what is all the crazy stuff that you could do. And so I made this ultimate landing page for um, a high target account called ProfitWell. And uh, I was like, what is how, how can we sell personalization to profit well by just being ridiculous and show them all the ways that you can use it? And so for demonstration purposes, just for, you know, stuff and giggles, you can look at this for inspiration. You're not going to use all of it. In fact, um, you probably won't or shouldn't use all of it. But here's what you can do. Bring in company logo if you're trying to get a key account. Pull in their email automatically pre-filled in. Then show uh, people like them that have opted in. Even use their first name in the copy. Oh, and by the way, that is a mock-up with their homepage's website in it. So instantly when they show up, we know IP address equals this at the company. And then take a screenshot of that homepage, send it to the mock-up, and it updates. Uh, as they go down, we do the same thing with uh, a little bit of catered copy. 
Then we have a, a mock-up that pulls in their LinkedIn information. So uh, we know on LinkedIn, this is all public information. So uh, I don't feel bad about anybody seeing it. You can go on LinkedIn and see that ProfitWell has 71 employees, and they're based in Boston. Um, but imagine if you showed up to this page as ProfitWell, you're like, oh my god, so personalized. Now they're thinking, how can I use this? So I hope you guys are thinking this well. If you have a couple key accounts, think about how you could personalize the experience based on them. And maybe it's not revealing the fact that you know they have 71 employees. Maybe it's changing the pricing for enterprise versus SMB versus startup. There's a lot of ways, but now that you know you have the data, you can change the content. Pull in a background image of their hometown city because they love that. It's not for increasing conversion, it's just for delightful factor. Um, SAS is their industry based in, and then changes the, the city name to wherever their IP address is. And then uh, content that they have not yet view, viewed. We'll know in our Google Analytics if they've viewed a page or not. And so if they viewed it, change it out, swap it out for something else. Show them now the next piece of content. And how many guys do content based on where they are in the life cycle of the journey? Good. That's exactly what you should be doing. In the beginning, get to the awareness. By the end, your content should be us versus them. So you can cater the content just for the right person. Ultimately, we're in a very interesting position in the market. It's hyper growth. The, the innovations that are happening right now in Silicon Valley are every six months rapidly changing. And so this is a super exciting time for you because this is what we know about most marketing in the past. We're bombarded with commercials that don't matter. But because of data, we've been able to figure out how to personalize. And luckily for Facebook, asking us who are, uh, t having us do uh, uh, quizzes like who's your Disney princess to get to figure out what's your Myers-Briggs, then they can now personalize you based on if you're an introvert or extrovert. Isn't that interesting? What about 10-year challenges? How many of you guys did the 10-year challenge? They're mapping out age and how to track age over time and create algorithms around that. There's a lot of data being collected, not through forms and not just through third party, but just by interacting, right? You click on a, uh, a comedy on Netflix and therefore show you more comedies that you might like. Advertising has been personalized. And so I know for a fact that 10 years from now, all those hands will be raised, that your website will be personalized because the data is finally getting close to being there. Once it gets centralized into a source that you can tap into instantly, then you know, it's off to the races for you. Uh, that's why Amazon is winning in the e-commerce space is because they were able to track cross-vendor pollination. That you know, if you uh, buy a phone case like this, you might also like a pop socket from another vendor increasing ultimately Amazon sales. So there's a lot of cross-pollination happening with data, which is really good. Here's what Amazon looks like to me in incognito mode. Oh, it is awful. Uh, I don't have a lawn. I, work, I live in an apartment. Uh, I've never bought uh, those kind of sandals before, and they definitely don't know what my style is. Uh, and none of this is really all that relevant to me. As soon as I log in, Bam, uh, they know I'm in a volleyball league. They know I like to play drunk games with my friends, favorite Friday night activity. Uh, they know I like to keep my place very clean. And um, I, I, do, I do wear hair gel, yeah. So uh, there you go, here's what I'm reading. <laughs> um, and then I looked in YouTube and I, I see hot ones. I like to watch famous people eat hot wings and try to answer questions, it's really fun to me. Uh, so I, I see the Jonas Brothers are trying to eat hot wings while being interviewed and uh, Here's Casey Neistat on a Tesla. These are, are things that are relevant to me, but probably not many of you all. The average YouTube would not be interesting to me, but the only reason why I'm here is because they've curated it specifically for me. So ultimately, you wanna delight your website visitors and give them a delightful experience because it will achieve maximum conversion. I hope that you guys will help me on this mission to make the internet delightfully human. Just go out. And today, try and make your experience just one touch point a little bit more human and a little bit more delightful. And whatever that means, whether it's sending a selfie in the email of, hey, welcome on board, 
or it means changing the headline to say welcome back to a customer and trying to sell them instead of trying to sell them again. I appreciate you guys so much for listening. My name is Austin Distel. You can tweet at me anytime, um, and I'd be happy to talk shop on personalization. And I think that we have maybe a few minutes to answer questions now. Thank you. Any questions here? Awesome. Well, if it does hit you, I'll be out there for the next few hours. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Austin. I would